Good morning, and welcome to the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce's discussion, Five Years of Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, in Brazil. Today, we have a panel of specialists and decision makers who will explore several SDG initiatives. I am John Welch, Executive Director of the Brazilian American Chamber, and on behalf of the Chamber, we wish you all health and safety in this difficult time. We thank you for coming. Education is one of the main determinants of economic growth and well-being, and several organizations are taking the lead in education in Brazil. We are honored to have two of our members, Fundação Abrinc and Fundação Dom Cabral, here to dis discuss their initiatives. They will investigate the import importance of cross-sectoral collaboration, both public and private, to achieve the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs as well as using private sector motivation to foster SDGs and collaboration that has already generated some promising proposals. They will also look at the crucial role of education and international exchange, specifically the European Union's Agenda 2030 and policies to protect children and adolescents, which has generated interest in partnering to implement Agenda 2030 in Brazil. Let me briefly introduce our panelists in order of presentation you can find their full bios on the link provided on the reminder sent out yesterday and on the Chamber website. First, we have Vitor Grassa, who is, who is the CEO of Fundação Abrinc, a nonprofit organization that works to defend the rights and citizenship of children and adolescents in Brazil. He has volunteered as director of APF, Associação Paulista de Fundações, advisor of Capdomo's Initiative, advisor of ABCR, Brazilian Association of Fundraising, and member of the Movement for the cultural, culture of Donation. He also specializes in fundraising, having studied at Indiana U University at their Center on Philanthropy. Second, we have Thiago Pataglini, Pataglini is, who is the coordinator of the FADC SDG, Strategy Strengthening Project at the Fundação Abrinc. He is charged with presenting and monitoring of the SDG strategy and the project to strengthen the, net, the network co-financed by the uh, European Union. An overview of the five years of the 2030 agenda in Brazil, uh, in Brazil uh, and the child. He graduated in international relations, UNESP Franca, and has a master's degree in human and social sciences at the Universidade Federal ABC. Stefan Agne is head of the cooperation sector at the European Union delegation in Brazil. He has worked in different areas of the European Commission and international cooperation and was part of the European Union's negotiating team for the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. He holds a PhD in Agricultural Economics from the University of Göttingen in Germany. And finally, we have Heiko Spetsek, uh, who is professor at the Fundação Dom Cabral in Brazil and director of the Sustainability Management Research Center. He teaches courses on impact entrepreneurship as well as sustainable business at the master's level uh, and also to senior executives. He has worked with companies such as Nestle, Michelin, Andre Maggi Group, Benedas, Group Pão de Açúcar, Coca-Cola, Tigre, BASF, and Braskan, among others. He is also a well-published academic with a recent book called Social Entrepreneurism and All That Jazz, co-authored by David Grayson and Mel Melody McLaren. He previously lectured at Cranford University Cranfield University in the United Kingdom and held visiting positions at the University of California at Berkeley, Fordham University, and the University of Extremadura in Spain. He was educated in Germany, Spain, and Switzerland and holds a PhD from the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Before we begin the exploration, I would like to ask you to please uh, use the Q&A tab for questions. You can find this at the bottom of the left-hand side of your uh, screen, or at the bottom of your screen, and you can make those questions at any time, and we'll look to answer them after the panel discussion during the Q&A period. Thank you very much. Vitor? Oh my God, uh, Vitor, you're on mute. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you for the team to invite us to talk a little bit about the Brink Foundation in Brazil. I'm going to share my presentation with you. Okay. 
So, Abrink is the Toy Manufacturing Association. They start a uh, department in, in, in the association, and for sure, toys and children's, uh, they, they started to do this after a dictatorship in Brazil, so rights start to be very important. We have in our constitution an article saying that children's uh, priority. So they started in 1919, a Brink Foundation, but the sector is very small. So they open to everyone in uh, other sectors. So we have all kinds of companies here. And our mission is to promote the exercise of citizenship and to defend the rights of children. Uh, a little bit of Brazil, more than 200 million people and 65 million children. It's a challenge for us. Brazil is doing well, but we still have uh, some, some issues here. Um, uh, um, okay, now. 2.4 million uh, children in child labor. When we start, it was 8 million children, so it was a huge problem. It's still a problem. It's, it's too important, but we are increasing the number of children in schools, which is very important. It's a way out of the poverty. So education is very important. So we have some index here. We work to, to, to do better than we are doing now. And as you know, Brazil, it's a huge country. And for sure, there are uh, others in the worst situation, but every day, 114 children under five die in Brazil every day. It's like a plane falling down with children inside, and which is more important, it's preventable causes. So we work in this to end this. Uh, Brink Foundation, the resource we work with, we, we don't have money from the government here. Our resources come from companies different, more than 5,000 companies support us, individual uh, monthly donations. So more than 30,000 nowadays, and national and international foundations. And when I say that we have lots of companies and people together, it's more than people giving us money. It's an, an asset, it's people supporting us. We have for sure more people in our uh, social uh, networks, but it's, it's very important to have people uh, believe in our work here. We don't have uh, children here, so we, we don't work directly. We work through other NGOs. We support more 300 NGOs in Brazil, all over Brazil. I'm going to show you in, in the map. Companies, they help us to support us and work together in some projects and programs. Volunteers, we have more than 1,000 volunteers, and we don't receive money from the government, but we work together to improve public policies. So education is very important, and media, because uh, as we know, it's very important, the environment, it's, it's in the media nowadays, but it's important to, to have space for children and talk about children every day in, in the media. And we are celebrating uh, these years, this year, 30 years uh, of working in as a Brink Foundation uh, without celebration because of the pandemic. And we benefit more than 80, 8 million children uh, in Brazil. Uh, we are here in Sao Paulo. Some, uh, the, the office is in Sao Paulo but we support to have activities all over Brazil, as you can see, and those 8 million children, they are all over Brazil. Uh, here in Sao Paulo, we have uh, programs and projects in the Northeast, which is very important. In uh, Brazil, we have more than 5,000 cities, and we are present in more than 2,600. Uh, some pillars, so, uh, and edu education is an important pillar here. So to access and quality is very important. As we talked about the child mortality, it's another pillar. And the protection, we started, we have in our DNA 
to end child labor and all kinds of violence. And now we're going to talk a little bit about some programs here. So we start in supporting other NGOs. So we give them money for two years, technical support, and they, they after that we need to keep uh, attending the children that we support. So we, we give them the support to raise money to keep this, this work that we start us. Uh, we, we give grants more than 300, thousand dollars which is one million sixty nine one thousand reais it's more than sixty thousand children benefits and all the programs that i'm going to show you we have the sdgs that uh, do these programs work the sponsor he, here is sabrin and the budget uh, so here we work with ngos we have another program called uh, child-friendly company. We ask the companies if, we, if they don't have child labor and they support programs to help children, don't need to be with us. We record, recognize them as child, uh, a child-friendly company and they have a, a seal that they can use in the products. Uh, Adopt a smile, so we, talk, we, we work child, uh, we talk about support NGOs, companies. Now they are volunteers. The majority they are dentists who support children in their offices. So we have the sponsors, the SDG, and the budget. Daycare center. Uh, more than 50% of the families here are headed by women. So it's very important to them to have daycare centers. The goal is to have 50% of access. Nowadays, it's just 30. So, you know, the, the huge problem that we still have. So it's very important to, to, to find a place to those children. Um, zero mortality. So we talk that 104 children under five dying every day. So we need to do this partnership with mayors. To, and it's SDG free that we support. And uh, we talk about NGOs, companies, volunteers, and we have it last year more than 100,000 children. But those 65 million children, they are in the cities. So we ask the mayors to prioritize children in their term. So it's four years here in Brazil. So we monitor them, they need to give us a diagnosis and as you can see, more than 2,000 mayors signed this agreement with us. Uh, however, uh, we, because we monitor, they were just 125 recognized this year as a child-friendly mayor. So it's huge. So it's very important. And uh, in those 125 uh, cities, there were more than 5 million children benefited. And here's some partners, and I'm not going to read uh, all of them, but they are very important to helping us. Uh, I think I did it in, in the right time. Now I'm going to give you Thiago to explain the SDG goals. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Victor. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. And good morning, everyone. Thank you, John, for having us and for the opportunity. Um, so uh, the 2030 agenda is a milestone for the international uh, debate on sustainable development. Uh, it meant great improvement compared to the Millennium Development Goals that went from 2000 to 2015 period year. Uh, after that, the United Nations established the 17 goals for the 2030 Agenda. And uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, uh, and then uh, the Fundação Abrinc identified 10 of them that, as directly related to children and adolescents. 
uh, those who have an impact on their living conditions, as you can see the uh, presentation. Uh, and to support and boost the implementation of the SDGs in Brazil, uh, the Fundação Brinca applied to the European Union Finance Project selection uh, to strengthen the Estratégia DES, a network of organizations that work towards dissemination of the 2030 Agenda in Brazil. Uh, the project has two more organizations as a partner, uh, Frente Nacional de Prefeitos and Agenda Pública, and, uh, and, three, uh, and the three of them, us and the other two, are part of the steering committee uh, formed by nine organizations that represent the, uh, four different groups, civil society, private sector, local governments, and universities. All of them target groups of the project. So uh, that's the main uh, purpose of the Strategy DES. Um, so why do we work with the SDGs? They are considered a planning for, for a sustainable development, a concept that considers uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of uh, future generations to meet their own needs. It also represents a, a broad notion of development beyond economic growth, uh, including the need to reduce uh, social inequalities and protect children's rights, for example. Uh, you can plan uh, a long-term agenda and not take care of your children. Uh, another innovative approach by United Nations is the multi-sectorial partnerships which aims for not only public organizations, including uh, local ones, but also private sector and civil society organizations. Um, and the publication, five years of the SDGs, right? So how do we come up with the data on the publication? It's based on the adapted targets made by the Institute of, for Applied Economic Research in Brazil, IPEA. Uh, uh, as an overview, the Brazilian performance remained stable through these five years. Uh, the country needs sig a significant improvement on its performance to reach the goals and targets because it was stable, but of course, we're not on the right track, so you can say. Uh, if we remain on the same pace, uh, we won't reach most of the goals by 2030. Uh, the period analyzed was stable, but in fact, most of the indicators show a slight decline in the first half, so, and then a slight recovery during the second half. But uh, we have to keep in mind that the data goes up to 2019, so it doesn't take into account the pandemic period. So we still have to uh, analyze and wait for the impact, right? Um, if we zoom in, uh, we can know the performance for each one of the SDGs on the publication, right? I brought some of them as example here. The, the goal uh, one to end forward uh, on the, uh, the target we it chose still have 45.4% of children living in households with income inferior to half minimum wage. Uh, I chose this one to mention because it, it makes it clear that the vulnerability of children as a percentage in this group are almost is almost 20% more than the average population, right? Uh, the SDG 5 also emphasized this case as 76% of violence and sexual exploitation notifications are from the under 19 of age group. So they are more vulnerable. And another one that I would like to highlight is education goal number four as we still have 6.1% of dropouts among high school students, and we'll probably get worse with the pandemic crisis. Uh, we all know the, uh, how these situations of violence and lack of adequate public service damage children's future. From a general point of view, uh, the country had a stable performance on the targets shown from SDGs one, two, and th uh, one, three, and five in the period, while got slightly better on number four, uh, with the dropouts decreasing, uh, we, and worse on SDG2 with uh, chronic malnutrition increasing, includes obesity as well. Um, 
uh, moving forward, we have similar situations of stability on the target of SDG 6 and 11. And while at the number 16, we got better, although the, the data is complex, we still face major challenges on 10, uh, fighting inequality. Uh, maybe the most difficult and important one to overcome in Brazil. Uh, and last but not least, the SDG 8 show that we still have 6% of children between 5 and 17 years old in labor situation. Uh, that's one of the targets that uh, Fundação Brink has on its Gen 8 fight against, uh, as we know the damage uh, the child labor can have on society. Uh, that I think that's a very summarized version of the all the data we collect and analyze it. The publication will be available for everybody. Thank you all for your time. I think the publication shows us that as a country we have a lot of work to do and the cooperation between public, private sector, and civil society is crucial to achieve the goals to which we committed to in the 23rd agenda. Thank you. And uh, Stefan, I think the floor is with you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much, Tiago uh, and uh, uh, Victor for the presentation, which I think is very interesting. It shows, it shows the, the excellent work that uh, Fundação Abrink is doing. And I must say that I'm, I'm very happy that we, that we support that work. Um, so let me first of all thank uh, John, the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Fundação Abrink, uh, for inviting me to this event and, and welcome all the panelists. I think it's a very good moment to talk about the implementation of the SDGs. This year we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, and I think this is a year to commemorate and honor the, the role of the United Nations and the importance our rule-based multilateral system. This year is also a good opportunity to take stock of the implementation of the Agenda 2030 and the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. We are now five years down the road in the implementation of the Agenda 2030, so a third of the time we have set ourselves to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals has passed. The successful implementation of the Agenda 2030 and its 17 Sustainable development goals requires effective cooperation between a range of stakeholders from government, uh, civil society and business. You, you mentioned that already in your presentations and are, are, are doing that. Um, but before coming to uh, our cooperation with the Fundação Abrink and Brazil, let me say a few words about the implementation of the Agenda 2030 in the European Union. Both Brazil and the European Union were actively promoting and negotiating the Agenda 2030 in 2015. So I think they were among the, uh, the, the, the leaders in, in this agenda. And I know that in Brazil, a broad consultation took place at that time to, to uh, gain the support of, uh, of the society at large for the implementation of the Agenda 2030. Well, in the EU, uh, the European Union and its member states are committed to the implementation of the Agenda 2030. Uh, which is our shared roadmap for a peaceful and prosperous future. The SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, feature strongly in all of the EU's political priorities. Sustainable and inclusive development is at the heart of the European project. Let me briefly refer to one of the EU's policy priorities or political priorities, the, the European Green Deal, which is Europe's new roadmap for sustainable and socially inclusive development. This new strategy will promote the use of sustainable, low-carbon technologies and promote further innovation in Europe's economy. The Green Deal framework provides many opportunities for sustainable investment and sustainable business and for international cooperation in these areas. The social agenda is also a very important part of the Green Deal, and the idea is to leave nobody behind. Since the adoption of the Agenda 2030, the European has made significant progress uh, in delivering on the SDGs and continues to reinforce its efforts in cooperation with civil society, the private sector and subnational governments. The situation of vulnerable children and adolescents in the European Union is nonetheless still challenging and needs care. 
Various reports from European NGO networks state that in spite of an increase of EU funds to support vulnerable families and children from disadvantaged backgrounds, these funds could be more extensively and strategically used. In order to support every child in need, the President of the European Commission, Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, supported the creation of an action entitled European Child Guarantee. This tool, which was initially an idea of the European Parliament, is to ensure that every child in Europe has access to the most basic rights like healthcare and education. Now, let me come to the next part of my presentation, which is about our cooperation with the Fundação Abrinc uh, in Brazil. Overall, the EU committed to implement the Sustainable Development Goals both in its internal and external policies. The project strengthening the SDG strategic network implemented by the Fundação Abrinc is an example for that. We thought uh, in order to have a, a good coverage in the implementation and help in the achievement of the SDGs, it is a good idea to work with networks of, of civil society organizations. And uh, Fundação Abrinc, uh, Abrinc has, has uh, submitted a very good uh, project proposal in, in this context. You have seen the, 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 the range of organizations that is involved in the implementation of the project in the steering committee, and also the, the linkages with the, the various uh, uh, other stakeholders I mentioned, in particular with, with business and, and local government. The project implemented by Fundação Abrinc aims at reducing the vulnerability of children and at contributing to the reduction of gender, generational and ethnic racial inequalities. You have seen that Fundação Abrinc works with the private sector, which is key in the context of reducing child labor, but also in view of creating employment opportunities for young people. We think that this cooperation should be further strengthened, cooperation between businesses and, and civil society and government in order to achieve the targets of the 2030 agenda. Let me just uh, refer to another area of work that uh, the EU is doing in cooperation with Brazil and other Latin American countries under a project, a program that is called Euro Social, a, a regional program. Under this program, uh, we are supporting uh, work on impact investments and social entrepreneurship in Brazil which we think is a, a very uh, uh, important initiative to promote uh, social standards in, in business and improve the implementation of the SDGs in cooperation with businesses. Now, let me conclude by saying that the unprecedented situation created by the COVID-19 pandemic poses serious and critical challenges to the implementation of the SDGs, especially for people in the most vulnerable situations. We have to chain off efforts to overcome the social, economic and environmental challenges of the pandemic and keep the path of the SDGs with the goal of leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Heiko Spitzig, you saw uh, Diretor do... Ah, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> back in English. Uh, my name is Heiko Spitzig. I'm the director for um, the Sustainability Research Center at Fundação Don Cabral. And while we're not um, working directly with children, we work with young professionals. And I want to share with you today an experience we were having um, on advancing SDGs by engaging these young professionals and the private sector. Um, and as Stefan just mentioned, um, one of the key priorities of the European Union is to have with the Green Deal. Um, and that means uh, working with the private sector, engaging the private sector in um, activities which also enhance the sustainable development goals. Um, and it connects everybody, like all the children who have benefited um, from the activities such as Fundação Abrinc and um, businessmen like Ojet Grade, who has had a, a very important role in the creation of Fundação Abrinc, uh, engaging the, the private sector um, in Brazil um, in the sustainability agenda. Um, I think we're seeing here a new seed of hope 
um, of how young professionals are, are getting engaged. So the experience I wanted to share is um, the Center of Entrepreneurship. Uh, we had a program last year, which was the um, Young SDG Innovators. It's actually a program from the United um, Nations Global Compact. Um, and the program aims at the six months pre-acceleration program, challenging young professionals who are between 18 and 35 of age, develop business innovations, which simultaneously advance the sustainable development goals. Um, and of course, as it's, um, as it's a partnership with business, um, business needs to understand, okay, what's in for us in, in these um, collaborations. So why do businesses um, solicit um, participation in this program? They see that um, effective for talent retention and development um, because we realize that more and more young professionals are, are not um, buying the deal of wasting life in office in, in, in turn for a salary which plunges on your current account at the end of the month. Um, they wanna have purpose, they wanna contribute to something bigger. Um, it also accelerates innovation. It, it turns social and environmental challenges into business opportunities. Um, it evidences purpose beyond profit, um, which is something a lot of corporations are looking right now in, in redefining their purpose statements and mission and vision statements. And it helps as well companies in the um, more volatile, uncertain environment, the VUCA environment, to shift their culture from a command and control culture towards an ownership culture where young professionals um, take the perspective of the owners um, and implement solutions and look for new businesses. Um, so, you know, I, th I think like the examples speak for themselves. Um, so I, I picked two um, more in a detail. NEDEC um, in the south of Brazil. Um, Youngsters were looking at um, the issue of sand production, which is used for foundry processes and normally then are discarded. Um, so they looked at upcycling opportunities of using, reusing that sand in other applications, which is not foundry. Um, so diverting waste, going, not going anymore into landfills, but in going into other productive um, um, processes and other companies. Um, with a clear business impact. Um, first, it reduces disposal costs, and then it generates as well new revenues as um, the sand, which uh, previously was going to landfill, now is um, used in other production processes. Um, this project um, contributes to SDGs 9, 11, 12, 15, and 17. Um, and I think this was one of the typical projects. We had a lot of the 15 projects we were um, accelerating in this program we're looking at a circular economy on logics and um, using waste or avoiding waste, recycling um, waste and, and putting it to new um, usage. The second project is Sicredi, um, which is a cooperative bank in Brazil. Um, they provided a, a new special credit line to motivate their um, cooperatives, associates, uh, to install solar energy panels um, by doing so, the associates can generate income and by selling excess energy back to the bank, um, the bank is able to improve its renewable energy percentage in the energy use they have. Um, as well, a clear business impact, it attracts and maintains clients um, and it diversifies risks in energy supply, um, SDG impact on 7 and on 13. Um, obviously working on renewable energies and avoiding climate change. We worked with 15 companies and you can see here a selection of those. Um, I think another interesting project here to mention is from the Bolsa Brasil, um, which is the Brazilian Stock Exchange. They worked on um, diversity, especially giving women training for advancing their careers in the financial sector. Um, so um, there's also something um, more for diversity. It's a, a couple of projects. It was not only um, circular economy type of, um, of ideas which we were accelerating. So these were the companies we were, were working for. And what did they say? So here you can see a little bit, okay, what was the feedback we received? 
um, from the sponsors, which normally were a director level at the companies um, and the, the youngsters who participated in the program. So we can still clearly see that the project added value to business, um, that they were able to transform business challenges, uh, sustainability challenges into business opportunities. Um, the project advance was the lowest in the whole evaluation because um, the learning impact, um, which is the, the third, um, uh, the fourth um, column here, the learning impact was most um, um, valued or um, observed in that example, because of, of course, as junior entrepreneurs um, enter into uh, a journey which capacitates them to sell a project internally, to create a new product and service, um, they learn a lot along the way and not necessarily all projects advance um, at a very high speed because um, these people, like the participants, have very little experience in selling projects and, and being entrepreneurial. Um, we see that these numbers normally go up at later stage entrepreneurs which have more experience. So then it becomes more uh, uh, innovation um, quality. While at the beginning with junior entrepreneurs, uh, we see it's more a uh, talent and talent development agenda in these projects, while at the same time recognizing that all projects added value to business. Um, and in this, in this um, advance of the SDGs, um, I see that a lot of players are now working together um, and this project wouldn't have been possible without the Global Compact, without uh, Fundação Don Cabral, and without the knowledge and the global network of the League of Entrepreneurs, which is an international NGO working in over 20 countries to connect impact entrepreneurs uh, and leverage their actions. Looking at everything like at Abrink, at uh, the European Union, and all these uh, initiatives, um, Actually, I have a dream. I have a dream for the next five years using online education to unlock the potential of young impact entrepreneurs all over Brazil um, because the participants we had were basically coming from Sao Paulo, Rio and Belo Horizonte um, as well as in other countries. And I think we can even challenge them to develop specific solutions which benefit children. Um, and their ecosystem in which they grow up. So I would love to um, motivate you um, if you're interested in this topic and um, get in touch. I'm leaving here my contacts um, because I find this in a very exciting um, times, exciting projects and an interesting way to get uh, young professionals engaged in advancing the SDGs and engaging their own companies and the private sector. Thank you very much. You're muted, John. I got caught. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, thank you very much, Heiko. That was fantastic. And the, all the presentations were really uh, fantastic. Fantastic and inspirational as well. We do have some questions. Our first is from Leona For uh, Foreman, the, the creator of the Brazil Foundation. And this is to the Fundação Abrinca. I think, Victor, you want to uh, answer this. You do incredible work under normal circumstances. My question is, how did the pandemic influence your activities responding to the dire needs in communities, especially in the north of Brazil? So thank you, Leona, for the question. She knows us, so it's really different that we are doing now here. Uh, because it, normally we support NGOs uh, training, so talk about education against child labor, but uh, we started the program here and we give more than 22,000, I don't know, don't know the name in English, but I'm gonna try essential food basket which we call in Portuguese cestas básicas. I don't know, John, if you know the name in English. <laughs> and it's because children in Brazil, we have more than 9 million children that they eat at school. So it's very important to keep them, uh, give them so you give them food. So we 
stop at some programs, so remodeling, so some trainings, and we start to give them food. So more than 22,000 baskets. So it's food for people here in Brazil. Very good. Our second second question also uh, to the Fundação Brink and, and certainly Heiko uh, or Stefan, if you want to um, um, jump in. Uh, really, there's a question about um, um, dropouts from elementary and middle school uh, and uh, preschool cover. Uh, I remember when I was doing my dissertation in the 80s in Brazil, Roberto Macedo headed up a team uh, with the UN to look at exactly that. And it will be interesting to see uh, what you guys are doing, what your evaluation is, if there's been any improvement over the last 40 years, uh, and whatever you have to say about that, Thiago. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, the, actually, we, uh, Brazil improved a lot. Uh, if you take into account since 2006, seven, and so now, uh, the dropouts are in, uh, reducing every year, but uh, we still have uh, issues on that. Uh, in the elementary school, uh, we reached uh, from 4.8% uh, of dropouts to 1.5 in 2018. So it's, I mean, of course, uh, as when we, we move forward and improve, it gets harder to uh, zero in, right? So uh, every 1% or 1 1.5 in this case, uh, it's more difficult to to reach the student, but uh, and uh, I think we have to consider also the pandemic crisis because a lot of uh, kids uh, stayed out of school and there's a, a we are afraid that a lot of them will not return. Uh, m most of them in the high school, they probably just have to start to work because of the crisis. So uh, the government and social. Uh, civil society organization, uh, everybody has to be, uh, pay attention to, uh, when you start going back to schools because uh, a, lot of a lot of students may not return. And the, in the daycare and preschool cover, uh, we reached, uh, I think, uh, Victor said 30% of covering uh, for the, uh, the daycare uh, children. Uh, we still, uh, we, we are uh, far from the idea, but uh, uh, moving forward too. Uh, but the same problem, children is not in daycare or not in preschool anymore because of the pandemic. When they come back, uh, we don't know uh, who it's going to be, but it's very important to uh, make it available so uh, their parents, for example, can go back to work. So uh, it's another uh, Thing we have to pay attention closely uh, in the next period and next uh, uh, year. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Thiago. Um, and John, Michael, just a question for you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Victor. Just, just to say a little bit about this because it's a huge discussion here. When children can come back to, to schools. So it's very important those next year are going to see those index. So, I have to apologize. I, I was dropped from the call, so let me, uh, if you can hear me, uh, let me uh, ask Heiko a question. Um, so the old sort of uh, higher education model in Brazil, which has been changing over the last 60 or so years, but still when 
uh, students wanted to get an MBA or something like that, they used to go abroad. And now you have some great programs in Brazil developed over those 60 years for the Sonja de Vargas, INSPER, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, certainly Fundação Dom Cabral. Is, uh, you're not, and we've seen a, uh, because of the early sort of movement towards PhDs, et cetera, uh, going outside the country, we've seen many of those come back. Uh, and um, and uh, it, it's really a great initiative to, to try to work with uh, local universities, et cetera, in terms of uh, this, not only in terms of education and retention, but entrepreneurship. Um, can you give us an assessment of how it, this is working? Is there still very many barriers to going further with this? Or do uh, you see this is really, as certainly your sponsors show a lot of, uh, uh, acceptance uh, of this type of program, but I just do you do you see any uh, further barriers to keeping you know keeping people in Brazil for both education and working and at, at companies? I hope that John, I hope I understood your question. Why? Because my connection dropped. Um, but um, the barriers regarding entrepreneurship, I think like the, the, main, the main obstacle is like the advancement of the private sector and understanding sustainability, not only as a cost, but as an opportunity. So normally you can see that the, the companies we work with are organizations which are advanced in terms of sustainability. They're not only discussing ESG risks, which is, which is coming very, aggressively now in the, in the financial sector, but these organizations are also looking at opportunities. Um, and I think it, like you need to have a major management in order to do this and to support these youngsters. Um, but I feel this is growing, like um, I'm working on, on impact entrepreneurship since 2011. Um, and back then, like there was no interest whatsoever from the private sector. This has changed dramatically. Um, we see international initiatives with Uno Social Business um, doing international research and launching an international program. Uh, we have the League of Entrepreneurs uh, ever more active in a couple of countries. And um, I see Brazil, due to all these social environmental challenges we are facing, um, especially when it comes down to um, families, um, youngsters and living conditions, uh, we have these problems right in our face and we know that the, the private sector is very much engaged and I think the pandemic is re even reinforcing um, this orientation of um, how the private sector can contribute uh, because we see that there's a vacuum um, in other sectors like especially from the government um, um, uh, which forces the private sector to step up its game. Thank you very much. Stefan, I was going to ask you a question. How does Brazil compare with your experience in other countries in terms of, uh, or it, maybe just from talking to your colleagues at, uh, in terms of the 2030 initiative? I mean, how far have they gone? Have they been one of the better ones or sort of average or, re, uh, or, or, or high? It seems to me that uh, um, what Heiko has described is pretty, pretty good progress so far in this. Well, thank you. Thank you, John, for that question. I, I must admit that I don't have the data on the implementation of the SDGs in, in the other countries of uh, South America, for example, so it's hard, it's hard to compare. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, I think what, what uh, Thiago has, has presented is that, um, well, the, the, the statistics, the indices of achievement, they have remained at a similar level over the past, past five years with some slight variations going down a little bit, now going up a little bit. Um, but that, that in order to achieve the SDGs, more and more efforts are needed. I mean, we have been uh, in implementation now for five years. Uh, so if you want to achieve the targets by 2030 in the next 10 years, this is not a lot of time left to, to make this progress. So that is, that is going to be a challenge, and this is why, why it is so important to, to say, okay, the government plays an important role in this, but, but other players as well, civil society, businesses also, also play an important role in this. Um, 
in the EU, it's a challenge too. I mean, I've said that in my presentation. You know, we, I mean, we have, we have, we we have uh, also in the area of uh, vulnerability of children or risk of uh, uh, poverty uh, of children is an is an issue in the EU. So there as well, we we have to increase our efforts to to do more. But uh, no, I mean, I unfortunately can't can't make a comparison between different countries in in, in South America. But uh, no, as a colleague said from the uh, Brink Foundation. Uh, more efforts are needed, and I think the work that the, the foundation does is, is, is very important in that, in that respect. By, by helping people very concretely, as it, as it was uh, said, you know, be it uh, uh, food baskets for, for during the pandemic or all the other activities that are, that are, that are being done, I think that is, that is helping individuals and that is very important. But I, I think the role of the foundation as a networker and facilitator is also very important. And I think in general, civil society can play an important role in this, in, in connecting different stakeholders and, and uh, promoting new ideas, making things happen. Um, I really liked uh, the, well, both the presentation by, by Fundação Brink, but also Heiko's presentation. Uh, this idea of engaging young people in, in, in changing the, the approaches in, in their companies, the idea of uh, seeing sustainability as an opportunity and looking for, for a business within that framework rather, rather than as a burden or a cost. I think that also that all that very much reflects also what, what we are thinking in, in, in the European Union. And this is the, uh, you can say, you know, one of the basic ideas of, of the, the, the European Green Deal is to, to, to create a framework uh, that, that uh, makes the, uh, the right things uh, profitable also for, for businesses. So you invest in sustainability and that's the, the way to go forward. You invest in social inclusion and that, that's what, what will help your business as well. I think this is uh, something, of course, that cannot only be driven by the governments. This needs a lot of uh, awareness raising and also a lot of initiatives from the private sector and, and, and from civil society. So I, I think uh, the, the two uh, initiatives we have seen here, both uh, from the Abrink, you know, as a civil society organization that is, uh, that is promoting this agenda, but also what Heiko uh, presented on, on young professionals, you know, uh, taking up new ideas and developing new, new concepts and business opportunities. These initiatives are, are extremely uh, valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we have another question here. To all the participants, in your experience working with companies in Brazil, how open are they to fund the provision of smartphones or tablets to the young professionals, 18 to 35, who among the younger ones are dependent on distance studying and have no means to connect? I would also add, also at the, at the lower grades, I know we, uh, Tiago and Vita, you talked about that, but maybe explore that as well. But it's a question for the whole panel. I think we, uh, I don't know if they're open, but I think the, the, we're talking about Brazil. 200 million people. I think we have 250 million cell phones here. Uh, so I think the problem is it, it's internet access more than gadgets. I think like, you know, like looking at it from um, a business perspective, I think um, companies are not so all open to donate this equipment. Um, but if you can connect that to a program, you know, um, I don't know, for example, I think it was Porto Seguro who announced um, um, that you can become a, 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 a insurance agent. Um, with a short training and they're gonna uh, hire a hundred thousand people um, and they're gonna be paid for three months and this gives them of course a broader network of commercial activities so i think like if 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 the equipment is combined in a program which makes sense to the company and and gives success and has of course like access a wireless access or, or coverage. So these equipments can be used. Um, I think then it makes much more sense. I think the companies are not so open and um, to give donations uh, disassociated by any kind of program which makes use of this equipment. So I think it must be combined into something which makes sense for the company um, and is not simply, simply a, a donation or philanthropic activity. And of course, access, you know, like if, you, if we talk about uh, 
communities in the Amazon, um, internet access is a, is a big obstacle in many regions, um, especially there. Chicago, nothing uh, more? Um, okay, very good. Well, let me uh, ask a last question. Uh, how can our members uh, get involved, uh, especially our business members, but also those that are interested in, in helping you out? We do have representatives from two 501c3s that, that have uh, done projects with both the, uh, with Fundação Abrinc and uh, Don Cabral. Uh, uh, the Brazil Foundation and the Resource Foundation. But if you can give us, uh, for those that aren't going that route, perhaps just give us a quick talk on how uh, our members can get involved. So, uh, as I said, we don't work with the government money, so we need to support the companies and people. So we can, you be, can become a, a monthly donor and we accept credit cards, so international credit cards, so you can fill a form in our website. And as we were talking, John, uh, we have the Resource Foundation as a fiscal agent, so we can receive money from companies, invest in programs, that those are uh, in the presentation, and others. We can run a, a new program here with a company, depends on uh, the cause, so, for sure, relate to children from zero to 18. So we are open to talk to uh, with everybody and see what can we do together. Thank you. Um, Heiko? Well, you know, like, um, I think like many of you is the first time you heard about impact intrapreneurship. Um, so feel free to share the news. Um, there's a report um, available um, on, the, on our website uh, regarding what we did with the Global Compact. There's also a new edition uh, running from the Global Compact with inscriptions until the, the 12th of October. Um, and here in Brazil, we have uh, a free online course um, called Impact Entrepreneurship, which was um, supported by Veda Cheap, um, BASF, and Gerdau, and the UN Global Compact, as well as the BMW Foundation. So um, this is already uh, for free and available. Um, we are learning with that model, and uh, my dream would be to take this international, um, to have a free online impact entrepreneurship course available internationally, um, so we can uh, help young professionals um, to convince their businesses and convince their uh, managers uh, to combine innovation processes with advancing the SDGs. Um, if you're interested in that, get in touch. I would, would be a pleasure um, to continue the conversation. But if you're just sharing information about impact entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship, um, that's fine as well. So we don't need any money at that place. Thank you very much, Dr. Spitzek. You did share with us your links and contact information. We will also put those links on the website. Same with Victor and Tiago. You shared the different uh, places you can get in touch uh, with you and also follow you. Uh, and I really thank you very much for a, an inspiring and, and great discussion. Um, thank, and also thank you all for joining. Before we close, I wanted to remind you that our next webinar will take place uh, Thursday, uh, 24th of September, in two days, at 10 a.m., when we will host a panel discussion on Brazilian tax reform, an overview of the congressional bills. Um, until then, stay healthy and in good spirits, and thank you again, and thank you to all the panelists.